This is the story of three young people, one whose life was ended, the other two just vanished, and the families want answers. Listen closely. Maybe one of you will realize that you know something. Phone numbers will be provided for you to call in with any tips that you might have. Jesse Jerome Leopold was 23 years old and working in a meat plant in Jewell, Iowa on October 13, 2016, when he let his boss know that he needed to leave to get his medication. Jesse struggled with bipolar, anxiety, and depression, and according to his dad, Jerry, he usually used up his meds before his prescription was due. When he did... He sought out drugs from other guys he was acquainted with in order to self-medicate. Jerry believes that is where Jesse was headed to that night, to pick up some drugs from his dealers. Jesse never returned to work that night, and two days later, his roommates contacted Jerry to let him know that they hadn't seen Jesse. Jerry posted to Facebook that night asking for help in finding his son. The next day, Jerry located Jesse's purple F-150 pickup abandoned in Ledges State Park, about 30 to 35 miles away. The truck was unlocked and the keys were still in the ignition, and his wallet and cell phone were on the seat. Jerry knew that wasn't like Jesse. He always locked his truck. So Jerry drove to the Boone County Sheriff's Office and reported him missing. The Boone County Police Department, the Jewel Police Department, and Boone County Search and Rescue scoured the Ledger area several times, as well as the Des Moines River. Bloodhounds were also brought in, but they didn't pick up on Jesse's scent near his truck or in the surrounding area. Jerry believed that it was because Jesse's feet likely never touched the ground. Volunteers continued searching the area, and Jerry handed out flyers, but no sign of Jesse could be found. Ten days after he went missing, Jerry told the press that he believed Jesse was dead. He had left his work boots in the back of his truck, and he thought there was no way that he could have survived barefoot that long when the nights in that area dipped into the 20s. As the investigation went on, the police weren't finding many leads. There were many rumors floating around about these drug dealer friends of Jesse's, but there was just no evidence of foul play or anything else. Unfortunately, when Jesse's dad found his truck, he moved it to his house, so any evidence that may have been in it was now contaminated. It was repossessed a few months after Jesse's disappearance. Hundreds of man hours were put into finding Jesse and chasing down leads, and to this day, they have turned up nothing. Jerry firmly believes his son is no longer alive, so of course, there are those out there that know something. Jesse Jerome Leopold was born on March 1st, 1993. He's six foot one, 180 to 185 pounds. He has brown hair, hazel eyes, and he may be bald now. He was wearing a blue shirt, blue jeans, and no shoes. He doesn't have any tattoos, scars, or piercings. Of Jesse's disappearance, here's some of what Jerry has to say. I have said this before, but now is a good time to repeat. If this were a suicide, a body would have been found by now. If this were an accidental death, a body would have been found by now. If this were a crime of passion, a body would be found by now. But a well-planned, premeditated murder by dirtbags, that can make you disappear. A post from Jesse's Facebook page. This was my son, a good boy, and a good young man. Loving son and baby brother, friend to many. 
would have made a wonderful husband and loving father. He was murdered in Boone, Iowa, 10-13-16, at the age of 23. I am still trying to find his body. I want so badly to have my boy back and for none of this messed up stuff to have ever happened. It did, though, and I will never hear his voice, get a text, see his smile, or get a hug, or ever hear from him again. There is nothing right about this. It's all so terribly wrong and must be resolved. It just must be. Jesse's family needs answers. If anyone has any information, please contact the Boone County, Iowa Sheriff's Office at 515-433-0524 or Jesse's dad, Jerry, at 515-709-5087. The next case takes us to Whiskey Pete's Casino in Prim, Nevada, located on the California-Nevada border southwest of Las Vegas. Seven-year-old Alexander Harris was there for a family reunion with his mom and grandparents. After the reunion, they stopped at Whiskey Pete's around 11 a.m., and while the adults did some gambling, they let Alexander play in the arcade. The year was 1987. They were simpler times and not as much awareness of the dangers that are lurking around us. When Alexander's mom, Roxanne, walked him to the arcade, she said he was fine. 20 to 25 minutes later, when it was time to leave, Alexander was nowhere to be found in the arcade. Witnesses claimed to see him leave with a man in his 30s wearing glasses with blonde hair and a brown leather jacket. The two were holding hands, which caused the witnesses to believe they were father and son. A composite sketch of this man was drawn up and distributed. The search continued, and a month later, on December 30th, 1987, Alexander was found under a mobile home on the casino grounds, not far from where he went missing. He was fully clothed with no outward signs of trauma, indicating that he may have been strangled. When Alexander was examined, a fingerprint was found on his glasses and on his body were strands of blonde hair not belonging to him. The casino had a surveillance camera outside which showed a boy walking with a man, but it wasn't clear if it was Alexander or not. There were several guests and one employee which fit the description that witnesses described seeing Alexander leave with, but focus was soon placed on a particular guest named Howard Lee Hott. Howard was a 36-year-old computer programmer from San Diego, California, and when asked, he told officers that he had attended a land sailing event that day. Howard was arrested on February 9th 1988 at his place of work in California and taken in for questioning. When asked about the interrogation, Howard would later say, they spent the next three or four hours trying to make me confess to something I didn't do. He was held in a San Diego County jail and was flown to Las Vegas at the end of February to face trial. The case drew a lot of attention at the time. It was so overwhelming that Howard was fearful at the times he was outside in public. Trial began in January of 1989 and lasted five weeks. Between the defense and the prosecutor, 100 witnesses were called and 250 pieces of evidence was presented. The jury deliberated for three days before finding Howard not guilty on all charges. Alexander Harris was murdered 34 years ago, and his case still isn't solved. Whiskey Pete's is now closed, and it is unclear what, if anything, has been made of the fingerprint on his glasses 
and the strands of hair that were found on his body. Allegations have been made that officers focused their attention on Howard Hott purely on eyewitness accounts and didn't pursue any other possibilities, although they did question a few other subjects, all of which had alibis, as did Howard. Roxanne Harris, Alexander's mom, still lives with the grief of her loss to this day and is still waiting for justice and resolution. Alexander's nickname was Buster. He wore thick glasses and had a gap-toothed smile. He meant the world to his mom, who was a single parent. She remembers how full of life he was, his creative mind, and the times he would tug at her arm and say, Come on, Mom, let's dance. The next case takes us to Lexington, North Carolina, where 13-year-old Donna Michelle Barnhill left her home at 8.30 p.m. to walk to a friend's house. She called this friend before she left to let her know she was on her way, but she never arrived and she hasn't been seen since. In 1999, a journalist looking into Donna's case brought to the attention of authorities that she had an older sister named Anita that died in 1966 after falling out of a high chair. It was ruled an accident at the time. An investigation into that case was reopened at the journalist's urging, and the medical examiner later classified it as a homicide. She had died from severe trauma. No charges have ever been handed down in Anita's case. Just recently, however, a headstone was purchased by donations made from people in her community and placed on her grave 52 years after her death. Donna was born on March 19, 1967, she was five foot seven and weighed 125 pounds. Her eyes and hair are brown and she has a mole on her right arm. She was wearing an orange sweatshirt, jeans and a dark jacket the night she disappeared. Her parents are now deceased and she has three siblings that still live in the area. If you have any information regarding Donna's disappearance, call the Lexington Police Department at 336-243-3302. You may remain anonymous when submitting information. Thank you for joining Crimatorium, and until next time, take care.